Hey guys, welcome. My name's Jeff. I know we've got, I'm going to try to monitor the chat. I know we got Chris, Michael, and Defresh. Thank you so much for joining us. You're going to get rewarded early here. I've been doing some preliminary work and we're going to jump right in. I've got some material to share with you here in a little bit, but let's dive right in because I don't want to lose these objects in, I have a hill in my back. So we want to get to some of these object objects early. So here's what I was capturing is the comet C22 uh, E3 ZTF. I did not have a dark frame uh, where I thought I had a dark frame subtracting from this. And um, But this little feller is in Taurus. Let's go to... Um, Sky Safari and show you where he is right now in Taurus. And the most recent magnitude I picked up was about 10 something. And the image that you're seeing, of course, in Sky Safari, <laughs> it, uh, I wish it looked like that, but it, you know, it, it looked great a month or month and a half ago, right around the end of December, first of January. But um, it's still putting on a little bit of a show. But it's a magnitude 10. And that makes it a little bit challenging. Now what this is, this is a stack of 10 minutes of exposure uh, with 10 sec second increments. So let me start this again. And again, my darks aren't working real well. If you see that black circle up there, that's just a dust mote. And this is some, uh, probably some amp glow down. That doesn't look like my traditional amp glow, but it might be. And let's let's restart here with, uh, with some exposure. So I'll show you what the first 10 seconds looks like. And it's a kind of a new process that I've been working on here with the ASI Air is the stack, live stacking. And I think it's a pretty cool way to do a deep sky observing. Oops, that was the problem. I'm already in the trees. So you saw the, <laughs> sorry about that. So you got to see the stacked 10 minute images. Anyone who's late, I apologize, uh, but I've already lost the comet in the hillside. And uh, that was that brightness that you saw. And I should have saved that image. Oh, goodness, I did not. And I don't think I can get it back. So you guys saw it. It was on video. You're going to have to watch the replay if you want to see the 10-minute stack of Comet C22E3 ZTF. So that was it for that. So one of the things I wanted to do tonight uh, while we have a second is, uh, let me see how many are watching. Okay. Hey guys, I'm going to try to stay up on the chat. I'm going to get it up here on the phone here in a second. We got about 14 folks watching. Again, we just got a view of the comet before it went into my hillside. So if you missed that, you can watch the replay and see what a 10 minute stack of 10 second exposures looks like and the comet was at about magnitude 10. What I'd like to do now is just show you the equipment that I use for the the evening and then we'll get right back to observing. So here's a look at the uh, scope setup. Hey thanks for joining me this is Jeff, Jeff Ball Photography for our live stream of some winter deep sky objects tonight. We may stop by the moon for a quick view and I'm running out of time. So I wanted to show you what the telescope gear is that we're using tonight. So we've used this gear before. This is uh, the Astrophysics 92 millimeter, basically just a little more than three inch refractor. And it has the a focal reducer on the back, as well as the ZWO ASI 294MC color camera. I know it's getting dark. We are going to auto guide while we do some deep sky stacking tonight with the Botter 
a small refractor and the 120 mm camera all of this is on the zwo am5 mount with the carbon fiber tripod i carry this all out in one piece and we are just a little bit south of Huntington, West Virginia. This is due north. This is where the city is. That's where my sky glow is. And the south is not bad. I have a pretty decent southern sky. I'm right on the Bortle 4 edge. And uh, so let's, uh, let's see how we're doing tonight with this setup. We're hoping to do some live stacking as well as uh, of deep sky objects and then maybe check out uh, Comet the Green Comet. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I turned the mic off for some of the things that are playing. So thank you. I appreciate that. I need a producer. <laughs> so we are going to capture some of these. Uh, I was just showing earlier the meridian, uh, the divider between east and west. And it looks like Orion has passed. And let's see if we can capture some of Orion before I lose it in the hillside. So let me get back to my ASI Air. Let's start the live stack. And again, if you're joining us late, we already picked up Comet C, uh, Comet uh, C22E3ZTF before it went into the hillside. You can watch the replay in the first few minutes there and see our 10 minute capture of the 10 second exposure stack. And that uh, is uh, at magnitude 10 now is the comet in the constellation Taurus. And here we go. We've got, we're going to, we're going to stack some Orion here. M42, the classic, the early ones you might be able to see. I know it's hard uh, and you probably can't see my cursor, but this is the tra trapezium area. There are uh, four really design, uh, brighter stars here but there is a, a whole chorus of stars in here in the star forming region and um, this is the running man nebula i believe uh, ngc 1977 off the top of my head but what we're going to do here is stack some images uh, these are 10 second images that are being stacked live so we can hopefully build up some of the nebulosity of M42 and the Running Man Nebula that you're going to see down here. So while we're doing that, let's do a quick visit to what our uh, composition looks like. So this is that Orion in a trapezium area that is really fantastic, especially in long focal length telescopes, a great visual treat. And you can see here, these are the four stars that really jump out, but it's really a host of stars in this stellar nursery there in M42. And we'll click on M42. And we go to Object Info. Oops, still on, uh, sorry, still on the comet. There we go. 
And look at this fantastic image. They have a lot of Rob Gindler images from years ago, pioneer in CCD uh, astrophotography. So um, this is the Great Orion Nebula, M42, or NGC 1976. It's one of the brightest. It's great object in binoculars. And in any telescope, it just looks fantastic. It's the most studied and photographed object in the sky. It's visible to the naked eye. It's a hazy patch. And let me see, I want to give you some of the details here. There's a protoplanetary disk that's probably down there in that trapezium area. Or what, what could be in one of these uh, structures out on the, out on the wings of, uh, of Orion. Let's go back to our ASIR stack and see how the image is building. So this is the stack as it's building image upon image, just 10 second images on 10 second images on 10 second images. Oops, let me go back to... I keep forgetting, I gotta change my screen. Sorry guys. I never went to, uh, I never went to Sky Safari, did I? There we go. There's Sky Safari. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I have to keep going back and forth on the broadcast. But uh, there's Sky Safari. This is the Rob Gindler image that you can see here of M42. That's several years old, but it's still a classic. And, um, but this is kind of our frame. It's a little short of, uh, I, my calculator here in the in the Sky Safari is not showing the exact field of view because you can see the field of view. Here. So it's fairly close, fairly close. So we're still building that image. Go back to ASI Air. You can start to see this extended nebulosity starting to build up. And you can definitely start to see this running man nebula start to build up. For those who are Im imagers, uh, I am not auto guiding. I do have the auto guider on the setup, but it is not auto guiding at this time. I wanted to experiment with this and it looks like it just does a fantastic job. The thing I need to really work out is getting good darks to automatically subtract and good flats. If you're not an astrophotographer, a flat would kind of compensate for the, the light fall off. You can see here we have a light cone. I know you probably can't see my cursor, but if you look in these edges of the frame, you can definitely see the light fall off. There's less light hitting those corners. And a, a good flat helps to correct for that and makes this a more even photographic field. Uh, hey Juan, I'm just catching up on chat. Thank you so much uh, for joining. And um, Juan's with us from the DC, the Novak group. We have some Novak members joining us here tonight. And what I'd like to do is why don't we go ahead, since I got Juan and Chris on here, I was going to go ahead and share to those who were attending tonight our kind of our cool project. It's an NGC 224 Novak collaboration. And I just had a just a finally got time to work on this. I guess we were working on this image for uh, two or three months, maybe October into December. And you can see the four members here, Chris, Randy, Juan, and myself. And this is on the Astro Bin, and I will put, I will put a page up on my website that uh, goes into this image and um, what went into it. But basically, it's well over 200, I think it was 220 hours of data integration that we all captured. And this is what's called a narrow band imaging. So there's hydrogen alpha, there's uh, O3, and there's S2 that are represented here. And what I like to do when I, everybody processes their images a little differently. And in my case, I went with, it's a fairly straight um, 
fairly straight, what's called Hubble palette, an SHO. The, the S2 gets assigned to red, the hydrogen gets assigned to green, and the O3 gets assigned to blue. So what I try to do is keep it fairly faithful. We had so much good quality data that the blue you see here is the O3, and you have a blend. You know, you have a hydrogen alpha where it's green, and then the red is the S2, and there's rest two, there's S2 actually that comes out, out outside of this, this shell of the SH2. And then I'm not very good on the science part of it. I just know it's a pretty object. <laughs> And some call it the Rice Hat Nebula. Chris has a great description I basically copied. But uh, let me do something here. Let me go to, I don't know the easiest way to do this. I'm just going to jump around to everybody that uh, imaged this. And I think this is Chris's interpretation here. So, you know, each, I love the narrowband data because people can play around with it. And it, I think it just is an opportunity to be as creative as you want to be. Let's go to Juan's, and I think I'm going to hit Juan's interpretation. This collaboration link doesn't always, I'm not always sure I'm clicking on the right spot, but I think this is Juan's interpretation. Again, you can map these colors to different, and Juan also gets more into the science of it to where he, Notice he uh, mentions and notates this planetary nebula candidate discovery. Let's see if I can. I don't know if there are graphics. Oh, wait a minute. Here, here we go. I guess this is it here. Don't think I can. There we go. This object right here. So that was one of the purposes. I know that one and some of the um, more science oriented. I'm more of an artistic oriented, but I know one wanted to see if there were some opportunities for discovery. And then Randy has another unique interpretation of the object. I believe this is Randy's. He may have more than one interpretation, but um, he mentions that planetary nebula candidate. Okay, he has some. He has some other other images here. Let me see if they pop up. Uh, in this, but a beautiful, uh, you know, red and magenta uh, presentation of the uh, the object. So everyone had a unique, and I think maybe this is um, maybe that's the planetary. I know it's hard to see. Maybe this is that planetary nebula. Boy, if that's it, that really looks fantastic. Um, Hey, hey, Ori Nebula, thank you. I'm going to get back to the imaging here in a second. Uh, glad another Novak member is here. Yeah, one, it is very small. I think I actually erased it in one of my image presentations that I went through. I thought it was an artifact left over from um, Star Redux, Star, Star X. So uh, I'm not very good at it's doing science. I am all about... Uh, just about the artistic presentation, and you guys are are uh, great at uh, finding the the science. Okay, thanks, Chris, for confirming. Oh, yeah, here's a here's a really zoomed in part. Boy, that looks fantastic. So uh, I don't know, Chris, is there an is there an update on um, and or Juan? Is there an update on that pursuit of the planetary nebula candidate uh, candidacy? Uh, just let us know in the chat. But yeah, very cool. You guys did great on the science part of that. I'll have to go back and see if see if I erased it um, in my um, in my processing. So sometimes I can be a little heavy-handed on that on the science part. I've probably maybe I've deleted some supernova I didn't even know of in the past. So um, let me get back to the image. Let's see how we're building our Orion image and. Again, this thing, I think I have it set. Yeah, it's, it stops. So that was 10 minutes of, of data gathering at 10 second exposures, unguided. I gotta, I gotta tell you, I really like this live imaging. If I can um, get to where I can get a good flat applied and a good dark applied to this. Wow, this is cool. This is fun. This is really what I wanted to do in public outreach. So this started to look really good on uh, the NGC, um, I think it's 1979. So I think I can click there and save that image, which I should have done. 
uh, on uh, on the uh, comment earlier. And uh, what I wanted to do is go back to Sky Safari and show you just a little bit about this at NGC 1970. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, 77, 73, 75, all my glory years in high school. Um, let me catch up on the chat. Okay, glad that I had the planetary nebula. Yeah, that's a, uh, Randy had a really good uh, insert on that. That was fantastic. Makes me want to get back in solar photography. Yeah, Ori Nebula. Boy, uh, if there was ever a time to get into solar photography, now is it. Um, that is uh, that is a great time to do that. Uh, Chris, no update on the status yet. We're in the queue to get a, a spectrum run on it to confirm if it, wow, if it is a planetary nebula or just a hydrogen area, that is fantastic to hear. That's very exciting. So I, let's let's hope for planetary nebula, right? Not just another hydrogen area. So, and uh, thanks, Juan. Yeah, that M42 is. I like this live stack. First time I've had a chance to really play with it. So this is that uh, what what I have called Running Man. I don't know if it's kind of lost that uh, nomenclature over the years, but it's. Um, it's a blue reflection, mostly blue reflection. You know, there's always some hydrogen alpha in that area, 1,500 light years away. And the blue color of the interstellar dust reflecting light from the hot young stars. So this whole area there is, um, is a bunch of hot young stars getting energized. So let's go back to our data. There's our Orion. And... Let's see here. Let's go to let's go back to our the ASI Air does have a pretty nice planet uh, planetarium software. So before we lose things in the trees, let's why don't we go to Horsehead and let's see how we do gathering some short exposures on uh, on Horsehead. Do we have any requests? Uh, right now, if we could stay to the west of the meridian, that would be great. In the Orion area, Taurus area maybe, I'll try to get away from the trees. But uh, if there are some requests, let me know. And let's start gathering some data here on Horsehead. The great Orion constellation off of the what is it, off of Alnitak? Is that the star? Let's restart. Let's see how, it's a lot dimmer. It's a lot fainter than this Orion and Running Man, the M42 and Running Man area. So let's see how well our data gathers here with, um, with the horse head. forgot I had that ambient music playing. I don't, I hope that wasn't too loud. <laughs> I was going to have that playing while we spent a lot of time ga uh, gathering data. Okay, let's see how we're looking here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Don't quite have the camera oriented just yet, but there is the first sign of the horse head, if you can see that. And there's the flame nebula. Yeah, probably should have gone with a different uh, different orientation. Hey, DIY NASA, great to see you. Thanks for joining us for a live stream here. It's a, I, I really uh, applaud those who make this live stream work like Chuck's astrophotography because it's, uh, it's a lot of equipment, a lot of technology that has to work. And if you're just joining us, we saw the comment earlier. You'll have to watch uh, the uh, replay and see the uh, 10 minutes of data we gathered before the comet went behind the mountain. We just lost it in the mountain, in the hillside. Uh, Ori Nebula and the Horsehead, maybe M45. Um, yeah, let me see if I have another tree I have to manage. Ooh, yeah, Jim, we're definitely going to go to the California Nebula. And M33, yeah, 
Um, thank you, Chris. Let's look at, um, I might try M33 while we're gathering data here on the horse head. As you can see, it's starting to come in. I do have, if you're just joining us, I don't have a good flat that's taking out this dark circle you may see up here in the upper part of the frame. But let's go to Sky Safari and let me go to, let me see where we are in the sky here with, yeah, M45 should be good. And California, let's do those. Let's do M45 probably first. M33, oh, M33 might be tough for me, Chris. That's getting over here, right? Um, Got to show my, show my stargazing, uh, star finding skills, right? M33, where are you? Should be right in here, right? Oop, how about right there? No, yeah. Why do they call that the pinwheel? I call like two or three galaxies the pinwheel galaxies. Uh, Chris, I think that might be too low. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to uh, probably now I'm 31 definitely. Uh, let me let me do M45 first, and then we'll do California. Okay. Thank you for those requests. The first two so usually pronounced the like the first two syllables of Orion, short for Orion Nebula. Oh. Or or Rai Nebula, or Rai Nebula, okay, yeah, I see sixty three definitely. Um, let's see here. I, I shouldn't have said definitely because I had I thought we were I see what is it? I see four forty three the jellyfish. I think I was gonna do that. I see 63. Sorry about that. Okay. We could probably do that. Yeah. We might might need to do that now. Okay. Let me go back to our uh, let me go back to our image and see how we're doing. So here we are. We're still accumulating some data. There's our horse head. And now we're starting to get into that. Uh, I don't know. How long have we been imaging this? And I don't think it tells me how long my total exposure time has been. Maybe it does. Let me do this. Okay. It tells me I've stacked 26 images. It has ignored zero, and I've been imaging for four minutes and 50 seconds. That's cool. I like that. So that's four minutes and 50 seconds of 10-second exposures. And yes, R.M. Linitsky, Linitsky. Oh, gosh, I, I know that means, I know that probably is not how you say that. But thank you for joining us. <laughs> yes, let's do that. Yeah, the Unistellar Equinox. I got one of those too, Jim. Uh, yeah, the, some of the Novak guys talked me into that. I just don't know a good way to broadcast from it. There may be a way to do that. So this is part of my public outreach that I like to do for stargazing and try to get people interested in, in astronomy. So this is our uh, horse head and flame nebula as it's continuing to build. You know, I really like this. This is a, a pretty cool way to do imaging, just short exposures, stacking short exposures. And I can set that limit at a different level. Uh, see, I can say stack duration. Oops, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to change the, but I'm not sure how long I can go on total duration time, but uh, I like what it's doing. This is, um, this is what we're doing. I tell you what, while I go to that IC63, I'm going to, for those of, uh, of you who have just joining us, I've got a little video that shows you my telescope setup. And I think what I might do is play that. But I'm going to shut this down. Where are we here? We are 
And for those of, who, those of you who image, this is the camera setup. Um, I'm just using medium gain and it calculates the focal length of the scope at 491 millimeters. I've got the cooler set at minus 10. My guide scope is the ASI 120 mini and my mount is the ZWO AM5. So I'm going to shut this down at Oh, we have two minutes left, so okay. So it tells you how much time is left. So I've been imaging for about eight minutes. So that's eight minutes. We're gonna stop this, and I'm going to download that. What I'm hoping to do is just build a web page that just has these images from tonight, from our observing session. And um, so let me do this, and if uh, you bear with me, I'm going to let you see the uh, scope setup video so you know the equipment that I'm using. And I'm going, in the meantime, I'm going to be going to that IC63 and see if we can image that. Hey, thanks for joining me. This is Jeff, Jeff Ball Photography, for our live stream of some winter deep sky objects tonight. We may stop by the moon for a quick view. And I'm running out of time, so I wanted to show you what the telescope gear is that we're using tonight. So we've used this gear before. This is uh, the Astrophysics 92 millimeter, basically just a little more than three inch refractor. And it has the a focal reducer on the back, as well as the ZWO ASI 294 MC color camera. No, it's getting dark. We are going to auto guide while we do some deep sky stacking tonight with the Botter uh, small refractor and the 120 mm camera. All of this is on the ZWO AM5 mount with the carbon fiber tripod. I carry this all out in one piece. And we are just a little bit south of Huntington, West Virginia. This is due north. This is where the city is. That's where my sky glow is. And the south is not bad. I have a pretty decent southern sky. I'm right on the Bortle 4 edge. And uh, so let's, uh, let's see how we're doing tonight with this setup. We're hoping to do some live stacking as well as uh, of deep sky objects and then maybe check out uh, Comet, the Green Comet. Hey Jim, uh, that's a good question. I don't think I covered that in the setup, but Jim asks, how do you get your ASI signal into your home? Are you on your home Wi-Fi or do you extend the ASI Wi-Fi? I actually have, um, I don't know how long this is, but this is, I think about a 60 foot long ethernet cable that does come out of the, the ZWO ASI Air. And it's been the most reliable way I have found to um, connect and communicate with the ASI Air, and it works, I think, pretty pretty sweet. So this is that uh, IC63. We, we uh, went straight to it with the ASI Air. So what we're gonna do now, let's see what live stacking looks like on that object. I hope I answered your question, Jim. If anybody has any other questions, I'll do my best to try to answer those. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, Jim, this one's going to be pretty dim. 10 second exposures um, might be challenging. Let's see here if we can start to see any hint of it. Oh, I can maybe, I can maybe see averted imagination hints of it here. Uh, I'll zoom in. So I think this is part of that. Uh, you know what? Let me go to. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Can I do that while I image? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see 63. I don't know a way to get information 
on that object. Let's let that build some data. Let's see if we get anything on it. And in the meantime, let's go to, I know I got to bring you with me. Always got to bring you with me. Here we go, Sky Safari. And look at IC63, the near the bright star Gamma Cassiopeia. Again, another Rob Gendler image. And um, centered just 20 seconds north of Y Cass is very faint, diffuse, and elongated north south. It's primarily a reflection nebula, appearing blue in photographs because it scatters starlight. It appears larger but fainter than IC63. Now that's IC59. Um, about 600 light years away. Intense bath of radiation from Gamma Cassiopeia is evaporating its two nearby neighbors. The leading edges of IC59 and IC63 glow strongly. I've never imaged this for half of it is an emission object and another half is a reflection. Thank you. Yeah, this is, um, no, um, and Jim, just to answer your question, I am not using a filter. I just wanted to, um, to see what unfiltered would do here with these ten, this live stacking. Um, so there may be a time when I might try some filters. Let's see if we're being able to pick any of this out. <laughs> it looks kind of challenging. This is where you can see a hint of it there, but this is where you need just long exposure times, uh, stacked individual long exposure times. The short exposure time is just not enough to get that signal. I mean, I guess if you did three hours of 10 second exposures, I, I, right, mathematically. No, at some point you got to have the the signal above the the noise level of the C, the uh, CMOS, right? <clears throat> so that one's going to be tough. I'm going to. Where are we here? We are. About four minutes in, I don't know that we're going to get a whole lot more data. You can see a little bit of it there. But let's move on to another object. That one's probably going to be tough to build out. But I'm going to save it. Thank you for the idea. Let's see here. We had requests for... Yeah, let's let's try M31. I think we're probably still in the same vicinity here, right? We're in Cassiopeia. Oh, did somebody say Pac-Man? You know what? That one might that one might do well. Let's um, let's go to Pac-Man Nebula. <laughs> Thanks for joining me tonight. If you're here on a stargaze, we are. Well into our night here of looking at winter. Well, these are some of this this Andromeda and Cassiopeia would be more of autumn. You know, we're, we're, I I consider them more of autumn type objects. But uh, we're in the winter autumn window, catching the last. I don't do galaxies very well, and if you're just joining us, we caught the comet very early this evening. Hey Juan, thanks for joining me. Good luck with your imaging tonight. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good night here. Great stuff, and thanks for sharing this guide. Thanks, Juan. Have a great evening. So let's see how Pac-Man starts to stack. NGC 281, I think. There we go. Start to see some of that already build out. NGC 281, Rob, Robert Farah, yeah, great imager from the film days and did transition over to um, CCD. It's an H2 region in the constellation Cassiopeia named the Pac-Man Nebula. And you'll see, you can see why here in this image. NGC 281 was 
discovered in August by E. E. Barnard, a great, great astronomer. Uh, double cluster. Um, not a double cluster would be fine. This, this, uh, oops, sorry. I kind of forget. I have to bring you with me. So I'm over here looking at, <laughs> looking at Sky Safari and you're not. Uh, but you are watching the uh, gathering of the day. So this is NGC uh, 281, Pac-Man Nebula in Cassiopeia, a hydrogen alpha region. And let's go back. So let's see how see how the data is looking. Okay. Starting to pull a little bit in here. Probably need a little bit more time, but you can start to see some of the structure, hopefully, on your monitor. So we are almost three, well, we're, yeah, two, just two minutes into imaging the Pac-Man. Now you can start to see it pop out a little bit. Now you start to get an idea why we do multiple hours of imaging on these deep space objects because it's they're pretty faint against the night sky. Yeah, we could do the double cluster. Let me take a look at it here. Let's let's keep gathering some data here and let's go back out to Sky Safari, and let me see how far away it is. That's probably a good part of the sky. And I just want to make sure I'm not going to. Um, it should be right up here, right? There we go. Yeah, that's perfect. Perfect. Matter of fact, we can come over here and try some of these uh, guys. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll do. We'll do double cluster next. Should work out very well. Easy, easy to capture. And uh, with this color camera and these short 10 second exposures, uh, should get some nice star color in there too. So we will definitely check out Double Cluster next. Double Cluster and Perseus, another fantastic visual object, and especially in binoculars. I'm a huge fan of binoculars. If you've been to my channel, you know. You've seen some of the, my video on binoculars, um, and uh, I'm a huge advocate for binocular observing. Dan Ward is kind of our go-to. Oops, I'm getting into a tree here. You can see the light over here on the left edge. <laughs> so that's my tree. So I'm going to stop my Pac-Man. You can kind of see the Pac-Man coming into structure there, but I'm going to run out of going to run out of sky there. So let's do that. Let's save that image. And let's go to double cluster. I think, unless I'm in the tree that's right in front of my house, we should have a good view of double cluster. So let's. go to <coughs> excuse me yeah DIY we're gonna um, I'm hoping to get to Rosette kind of managing things on this side of the meridian right now I'll have to check and at this point I'll probably wait until Rosette crosses the meridian I'm not sure if it has yet or not <clears throat> but yeah, definitely that was on. I wanted to do the rosette and cone nebula. I think those would show up well. So let's um, go here and let's start accumulating our data for the double cluster. Ori nebula, or Ori nebula. I have a small visual scope for outreach. I lo love to just stay on the double cluster. It's a great object for visual. Looking forward to seeing in your setup. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. It's definitely a deep sky pleaser for the crowds. Um, it, absolutely, it looks fantastic in any any setup, and 
there we go. There's your double cluster. Don't need a whole lot of exposure. Thought I'd have more star color. I'd probably have to work that in. It's probably just the way this um, pre-processing works in the software. But um, yeah, looks fantastic. And you know what we'll see here is really more and more stars start to, with that extended exposure, it'll start to pick up more and more stars. But yeah, that's a great object. Great recommendation team on that uh, visual. So that's a good one. Let's let this pick up here a little bit. Let's go to Sky Safari. And let's give you a little bit of scoop on the double cluster. Yeah, look at that. You can see the color that pops out in these well-processed images. The key with these double clusters is you can't have them overexposed or you risk losing the color saturation in the core of the stars. It's been known since prehistoric times. Yeah, this one's this one is hard to miss. That's NGC 869 and 884, another Rob Gindler. I know young people do not know Rob Gindler or may not, but he is worth your time to look at his history and his impact on CCD imaging as the, we transition from film is not to be underestimated. Uh, the two clusters are stunning sight in low power wide field eyepieces. Each cluster is a half degree in diameter. 869 is the more compressed of the two and has over 200 white and bluish white members. 884 to the east has 175, mostly white and bluish white stars. 884 contains about 150 stars. <clears throat> they think that um, that 884 is significantly older than 869. Both are situated in the Perseus OB1 association at a distance of about 7,000 light years, and they are only a few hundred light years apart, uh, but both quite young, 5.6 million years old. So let's see how the data is accumulating. Short exposures would help, again, not burn out the core, but overall integration time could be problematic. Now this would be great to go at with a little higher resolution monochrome camera, but you can see here we've got, um, I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not guiding. <laughs> and uh, this stacking is pretty cool. It really works pretty well. And uh, we are at the, uh, how long have I been? Oh, here we go. We have been gathering data for almost four minutes now. So, yeah, cool object. Really nice. I like it. Good suggestion. I think I'm going to stop there, and we're going to save that. That's our double cluster for the night. Thank you, DIY NASA. Yeah, pretty cool. All right, what were some of those others here? Let me go back. I think 31, we've probably lost M31. I think we've gotten too low. Let me check that. Oh, by the way, if you were, if you had clear skies, <laughs> I should have said this earlier, and uh, you could go outside. Man, it was a beautiful, I'm guessing it was Venus-Jupiter conjunction out there tonight. So, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. I think, uh, yeah, pretty sure I cannot get at Orion. But since I know I've got clear sky here at the double cluster, let's do um, let's do the core here. What I think this is the Malat, right? Um, the heart and soul. This is the heart part of it, but I believe, oh goodness, I don't know if it gets into this designation. I thought this was called Malat something. Am I getting that confused for those of my people who really know their objects? thought this was Malat, but this is where we're going. Let's see what we can pick up there. It's like Malat 15. Oh, yeah. Hey, thank you, DIY NASA. Hey, I guessed it. I did not look at your answer. 
<laughs> Malat 15. Yeah, let's let's kind of go there. I think that's probably a cool thing. Two Rivers Observatory. Hey Jeff, how is the truck working out for you? Well, um, if you if you don't know, I'm kind of working on um, a project. Uh, if you if you follow my YouTube, you know that. Um, I love the mountains of West Virginia, in particular Spruce Knob and the Experience Learning Center, and it's one of my key uh, go-to destinations for astronomy. And insanely, I thought that the uh, F-150 Lightning would be the perfect vehicle for me because of all of the, we don't have power up there, and it would eliminate, it would really just provide all the power I would need to run my gear. And, uh, of course, I got to get there with a charge. And West Virginia is probably the, well, I won't say the worst state in the union for having rapid, what's called CCS, fast charging options, but we're, we're one of the worst. And uh, I just need a charger. Tesla's opening up their chargers. So to answer your question, Jen, um, who asked that? To answer the question, all two rivers, it's great so far, but the real test for me is taking it out on dark sky observing up to Spruce Knob. And I've got some ideas. There's a there's an RV park right there at the Experience Learning Center that I would charge my battery at while I'm parked, probably during the day. Uh, but um, let's see here, am I in the right spot? Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But uh, yeah, thanks for asking. I love it so far, and but yet I haven't put it through its paces yet. So let me, let me get to uh, the first night i mean i know for sure i'm going to the night owl star party uh, so if you don't know about that i encourage you to check the i'll probably put some links in the in the description is um the night owl star party is in may i believe well may new moon i'm not sure maybe it's not memorial weekend but i guess it's probably the weekend before and um so that'll probably be, i'm actually hoping to get to the mountains in April to do some imaging. I have one composition and some new gear. I've shot this composition before, but I want to shoot it with some of the new gear, new lenses and things that I have. So I'll probably um, get to the mountains in April and that'll be, that'll be another first test, those two rivers. If you don't know, I actually have a, another channel that I started uh, so this is uh, this is that Malat. Let's see how we get. Let's see how we build out here. Let's see if we can get some of that nebulosity. In the meantime, let me show you a couple of things. Um, so if you, boy, if you missed it earlier, we we did the comet. We taught how to talk about the Novak cal uh, calibrate calibration. Um, what do we call it? The Novak collaboration. Four imagers and Novak came together for this uh, SH2-224. We got over 200 hours. I encourage you to check that out. But if you don't know, um, I started a, a new channel. And if you like EVs, or you, you're curious about the Ford F-150, it's, it's called um, Charge On, Charge On with Jeff. I've got seven subscribers, <laughs> but I'm just going to present my take on the EVs, my experience with the EVs. I will, anything that's astronomy, EV related, will probably go to my uh, astronomy. I might go to both places. I'll try and I'll edit one the astronomy for more astronomy focus and the EV for more EV focus. But uh, yeah, I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. So that's uh, Charge On, an experience channel, EV experience channel with Jeff. So that's a new one. Thank you for asking, Two Rivers. Let's see how our data, okay, it looks like we're getting some things here. And uh, yeah, that's starting to show some promise. There's the, I think the Malat 15, right, is this, I um, can't believe that Sky Safari doesn't have much on that Malat 15. Let me go, because I guess that's a open cluster itself. 
Hey, Chuck G. Thank you for joining me. Oh my gosh, yes. I'm looking forward to Calhoun. What an amazing location. If you don't know Calhoun County Park in Grantsville, West Virginia, a tremendous dark sky location. The park board have gone out of their way to be accommodating to astronomers. If you want more, please see my YouTube channel. I've got a Calhoun County Park video that goes over that. DIY, yeah, I can adjust the stretch during the stack. Yeah, it's currently an auto stretch. Yeah, I could do that. Um, let's, while you're asking, let me, uh, let's go back to that. Okay. You know what, but I got to tell you, uh, DIY, when you look at it, you can see here, um, let me, let me, I gotta go to full screen here. You can see this is the auto stretch and it's already compressed. I don't know if I can change the um, scale. The problem is the scale here. You know, see, it's it's already stretched all the way. Yeah, let me let me see what. So then I pull, yeah. You can see it's it's already applying. A pretty it's it's applying really the strongest stretch it, it can whoops well that's the strongest stretch <laughs> sorry <laughs> now that's a good question a good point well I don't know how to get back to auto now There we go. Oh, wait a minute. What's Zoom do? There we go. There we go. Okay. Hold on. Now I got a little scale to work with here. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. This will this will get a little bit more out of the short term data. Okay. Kind of kind of makes a mess of the lower lower values. And we're clipping a lot of the stuff there, clipping a lot of noise, basically. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's a little deeper stretch. That's a good idea. Um, this this software has changed a lot. I haven't even been out under a dark sky in forever. Uh, get the set. Yeah. Also, you can adjust stretch and histogram. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it starts to make a little bit of a mess of uh, the noise, but we're here just to try to get a little bit of, uh, huh, why can't, there we go. I'm, by the way, I'm on a MacBook Pro, and using a uh, trackpad, <laughs> so it, it's not real precise. Yeah, that's good. I should have. I, I haven't played with this on the uh, MacBook, and they've done a whole bunch of. There's been so many updates on this ASI Air software since I last used it. Uh, all good. Every update they make is generally very good in my opinion let's see what happens about there okay starting to get a little bit better okay so I think this is the Malat portion that open cluster And this is part of the, uh, yeah, i got to figure out a way to get dark supply. If you're joining us late, you know, this big dust circle up here, dark dust circle up here in the upper left is uh, should be taken care of with a dark. And, yeah, you can definitely start to see the nebulosity popping out now. Yeah, DIY, it's, uh, to me... I am not a laptop in the field guy. 
So the ASI Air was a groundbreaking uh, tool for me, and I got I have three of them. The only one I don't have is the Mini. <laughs> so I'm still haven't found a really good reason why I need the Mini, but um, yeah, this is looking good. Yeah, I, you know what? There may be. Is there a control for saturation? I don't know. And I've never really done a whole lot of. I've never done a live imaging session, to be quite honest. And um, you know, Larry McHenry, if uh, if Chuck's still with us, and I, Chuck may know Larry McHenry. Um, out of Pennsylvania who comes down to Calhoun County and um, Larry had it again if you've not seen my Calhoun County video I encourage you to check it out because um, that's where I have a little bit of an intro into Larry's live stacking setup and it's just fantastic it's amazing <laughs> and uh, he really got me more interested in doing live live viewing, especially if from a dark sky, and you could really go after some some very difficult, especially visually difficult objects, uh, you know, Abel and ARP galaxies and some of the really obscure catalogs. Uh, and I might I might do more of that, and uh, I think it could be done through an app. Uh, so this is, where are we here? Okay, we're almost 10 minutes in gathering data on this Malat. So this, I'll let this finish out to 10 minutes. Hey, Bill. DIY has three. Bill only has two. <laughs> uh, I got the, any, do you have the original? <laughs> I still have an original. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, I love them. And, uh, the next thing I have to figure out is I have an all sky. I have the uh, what camera is it? Two two twenty four. The one that comes with the all sky camera. Larry McKinney had an all sky camera at Calhoun, and I, I wanted one so bad. So I've got an all sky camera on that one, and I am not a hundred percent sure uh, what the ASI Air will do when uh, if it can build automatically a time lapse or it, I think Larry was using um, th a third party software to build his time lapse live but that's it that is the Malat 15 and the uh, that's pretty cool that's decent probably still a little bit light here on that let me pull that in if I can yeah there we go yeah okay Got to get a better dark frame, but, you know, it's not bad. 10 minutes, 10 second exposures. That's cool. Save that. Two pros and a plus. Yeah, the pro, the, no, hold on. The plus, yeah. The plus has the antenna, right? Still, I'll, I will have to say I am still kind of disappointed in the Wi-Fi range of the, I, even the plus. I can hardly get it from my backyard into my kitchen. By the way, if you're just joining us, I use about a 60-foot-long Ethernet cable. My setup is out in the front street <laughs> so I can access the sky. And uh, so let's go back. Tell you what, we had a request for uh, M45. So And we also had California, too. Let's do M45. Real quick, get us a good reflection, open cluster, and yeah, DIY. I, I know it. It's Bill, put a high gain antenna, and that will Wi Fi works great. So, Bill, can you recommend exactly what to do there? I don't follow forums a lot, I just don't have time to follow all that stuff. So, I'm just a straight retail guy, and I don't want to have to do, but man, if you have a recommendation, on an antenna to add to that, I will do it because it's very frustrating. I don't like, I don't want to have to run this Ethernet cable every single time. 
you know, managing 60 feet of Ethernet cables is not, not always fun. <laughs> Let's see. Oops, what happened? Yikes. Sorry, guys, I'm not sure what happened there. That hasn't been like that all night, has it? Goodness. Huh. Okay. All right, let's do this. Go back here. All right, let's start gathering some data on M45. Oh, thank you, Bill. 120 feet, really? DIY, I throw a Google Mesh in the yard with it. Man, I, <clears throat> you know, DIY, I have tried some of those extenders over the years. Oh, let me go back to auto stretch. <laughs> That's a lot of stretching for M45. Let's, uh, let's maybe revisit this. Hey, thanks, DIY, for uh, encouraging me to explore this histogram manipulation on the live view and uh, there we go maybe we can get you know a little bit better there let's try to see how okay let's let data accumulate there and where is that little galaxy uh this isn't the highest resolution setup, but uh, what's this? Uh, is this Alcyon? I should know this after 30 years, right? No, that's, uh, there we go. Let's watch this one build out. Hey, I got my dark spot, dust spot there. Hey, Tim. Thanks for joining us. I have a mesh module that I can plug into my SI Air in the yard and it joins my home Wi-Fi. Yeah. That, I, again, if you have a, a plug and play link you can send me, I'll buy it. <laughs> a small travel router works well, 5 gigahertz and 2. Man, I've tried, what were those routers they were touting a while back? Uh, when the first came, when the first, well, I guess when the Pro came out. Man, I... I don't know. I just never could quite get things synced up. Now I have a met my Wi-Fi here at the house now is through Armstrong Cable, and now they have a mesh Wi-Fi system, and so we have that in the house. And uh, why is that doing that? You know, I must I must be hitting um, the. Must be hitting this uh, trackpad while I have the image highlighted and it's uh, causing that to resize. That's the only thing I can think. That looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Play around with. Uh... Yeah, if you got a plug and play option and a link, I'll do it. <laughs> and And something that. You know, it doesn't require me to know IP addresses and, uh, you know, talk to the Chinese balloon and, and all of that. So, travel rail GL AR750. <coughs> Slate. Okay, Bill. Okay. That I'm, I'm glad that I wasn't a total goofball on those original ones. I can't remember what they were called. You know what? I'm going to go up. Where did I put that? I had it upstairs. Matter of fact, I think I was going to throw it away. Um, I can't remember what they were called. 
but it's um, what that one fellow was recommending years ago. <clears throat> hey Tim, thank you. Uh, Tim, are you a uh, beta tester on the on the ASI software? It's been so many months since I've been out with my gear that so much changed from the last time. Matter of fact, I said, I tell you one thing they did do on the, I used the uh, iPad to do polar alignment uh, while I was out at the scope. And the one nice thing that they did with the ASI Air is they give you the option to decline the update as the software opens. So, and I did that. I did not want to do the um, the update. Okay, it looks like I've done another bad re sizing here. Yeah, let me. There we go. So yeah, I'm glad they gave me the option to skip the update. And that didn't cost me any polar alignment time. I was trying to get things in under the under the gun here. Yeah, TP link. You're exactly right, Bill. I I bought two of those. And they were garbage, in my opinion. Uh, Tim McCallum, negative. First time in four or five months here also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Playing on some new moon trips and need to get familiar with it again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the things that I tell people um, who want to get into astrophotography or astronomy is you need to get out in your backyard and um, get used to your gear, get to know your gear, Know how it works, even if the moon's out or if your skies aren't pristine, it's very important to get out and know how this stuff works because uh, I've seen many, many nights, many beautiful nights under dark skies ruined because people could not get their gear to work. And I always encourage have have redundancy, have two or three options. If you have a long focal length or a complicated astroimaging platform and you're at a dark sky and it's summer Milky Way, have a backup. Have a simple tracker set up with a camera lens, a DSLR, something you can use to capture some images. That's that's me. That's my the way I approach it. But uh, yeah, the TP-Link AX6600 works great for me. Yeah, I don't know, Tim. Mine's so old. This this was two or three years ago. Uh, hey, Franco. The the dark circle is a part of uh, a dust. It's a dust bunny up there. And I, I had this thing set up to do dark frames. Uh, you can see here I've got a dark that's supposed to, I thought, should be subtracted from the uh, live stacking, but I'm not sure it's doing that. So, uh, or I got a bad dark frame. Only, and only I'm not exactly sure how to do that in this live stacking process. So it's a good question, um, Franco. Thank you for joining us. But it's just a function of a dust bunny there on that chip. But the nice thing is, we're imaging in a bright area. Of the Pleiades, and it's almost overcoming even that dark dust bunny there. So for a second, let's let this finish out, but let me go to uh, Sky Safari, and let's do a little bit of a background on M45. If you're just joining us, we did the comment earlier. You will you can watch the replay as soon as this posts and see the uh, comment. We did... I, I had to do it early because it got behind the mountain in back of our house. So uh, that's, and I'm out on the street. If you're new, what I might do is just do the uh, equipment video here again. Let me do a check. But here we are on Merope. That's the Merope Nebula. That's right. 
off of that bright star, Merope. There we go. The Pleiades Subaru Seven Sisters, I believe, was on Jeopardy the other night. Yeah, uh, DIY, I did not have time to do a flat uh, at all. So that's that's another thing. I, I, everything was rushed tonight. I got home late and had some other things to take care of. So this does not have a flat. That, that would also take care of the, that would really take care of the dust. That's exactly right. Hey, Franco, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining. Antenna on Amazon, 8 wood, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi antenna, dual band. Man, that, oh my gosh, 10 bucks. Yeah, you got me, Bill. That sounds like the solution there. Uh, I will give that a try. I'm going to go there instead of a mesh. I'll let you guys work on the mesh network. This Merope Nebula is really, I think, the, the hallmark of the Pleiades uh, cluster. It's very important to maintain this dynamic range across the Pleiades. A lot of people like to flatten this out, but the Pleiades are, of course, um, well-known, well-documented throughout uh, biblical times, ancient times, the Greeks. Uh, every, every culture has referenced this and has some, some cultural story around it. And I believe, uh, yeah, this was a great Hubble image, I believe. Uh, Barnard's Merope Nebula image by the Hubble. Yeah, look at the intricate detail of that. I think you're seeing this, right? Yeah. Uh, how far away are these guys? Uh, they're not far, right? It's only something I thought it was like 70 light years. Pretty close. Let me see. Here we go. Uh, no, no, well, Aldebra, Pleiades. Uh, Surrounding Aldebaran is another equally famous open cluster. Okay, now that's Aldebaran. Hmm. Yeah, I used to. Yeah, thanks, DIY. Yeah, flat would do it. I just didn't have time to do the flat. Used as an eye test for archers. Yeah, the older I get, Bill, I can't, uh, I can't distinguish. So the eye test, how many are they, they if they can... If they can count, what is it, the seven sisters? Is that what the test is? If they can count the seven. Taijita, Solano, Electra, Maya, Estrope. Is that, was that count as one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, probably not. That one's probably not one. So it's Maya, Tajita, Solano, Electra, Merope, Alcyon, and Atlas. Probably. Okay, thanks DIY. 420 light years. Just had a C-130 aircraft go over at uh, 400 feet. Didn't hear it until it was on top of me. <laughs> uh, okay, Bill. Seven. Thing C the seven, huh? That's a. That means you get to shoot a bow and arrow. Right. Or you 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 should have. Uh, Marksmanship, unparalleled marksmanship. Let's see how our data is accumulating. And oh, just out of curiosity, I'm gonna go to that auto stretch. So you can see what it does. It, um, and yeah, that Merope Nebula looks pretty good. You start to see a lot of that cross section that's going on there. Yeah, I like it then we can help. That helps flatten the field out a little bit to bring that brightness up. Okay, that's a good one. Have we finished? Uh, where are we here? Yeah, that was it. That was 10 minutes. We'll save that. Some say 444 light years. Okay. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's looking good. What else did we, what else did you say? Oh, let's do California since we're right here in this area. Let's do California. Okay. 
Yeah, I'll have I'll tr I'll figure out how to apply flats and darks and biases to this live stream a little bit better. And that really I think could end up with some pretty darn decent. Um, Okay, Chris, I think it's painted on the caves. That, is, is that Lasco? Is that the French caves? I watch the Tour de France every year, and um, they frequently go past some prehistoric caves that are, I believe... Um, I don't think I think they're totally closed to the public now. I think maybe only science uh, science uh, researchers can access those caves. NGC fourteen ninety nine. Okay, framing isn't perfect, but it's not bad. Chris Kagan, yeah, French cave paintings, yeah. Neanderthal, yeah. That's good, Chris. 14,000 years ago, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, the bike route goes right past those caves. And you can see where the fencing is uh, in place, you know, restricted fencing is in place on those uh, prehistoric caves. But I can never remember the name of, of what they are. And they're, they're on a... Are they in the Pyrenees area? Um, I'm, I'm thinking they're in the Pyrenees. Not the Alps, but I, I could be wrong on that. I watch a lot of hours of the Tour de France. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen a lot of France from the, the helicopter. Hey, well, that was quick. 10 seconds, California Nebula pops right out. So this will probably look pretty good. Well, I still got that uh, stretch that I had on the Pleiades as well. And that stretch looks like it's working working well. So let's do, uh, let's do Sky Safari. See if we can pick up a couple of tips on, uh, see right up here. Yeah, that for, that field of view for my camera is definitely on the short side. And, you know, I thought I had the calculations right, but it's definitely wrong because that is, well, I take that back. That I may have the wrong camera selected there. The, it should be the ASI 294. I'm guessing maybe that's just, that's a smaller chip ASI. I'd have to go back in and verify that. But California Nebula, another Bob and Janice, Janice Farah. Great legacy. Um, great legacy astrophotographers, film based, and um, let's see here two point five degrees across. The nebula has a very low surface brightness. Yeah. So there's a difference in visually bright and photographically bright. <laughs> Compared to the other objects we, we have imaged tonight, this is relatively bright, right? But visually, um, I don't know, hydrogen beta filter. Hey, do we have anyone here who has observed? So this, I guess, and the horse head, right, are the hydrogen beta visual filter objects of note. And uh, I've never, I'm pretty sure I have never visually looked at the California Nebula or have seen it. Uh, it's a thousand light years away, the direction of the outer Orion arm of our galaxy. The entire region of space is filled with galactic gas. Massive luminous stars have formed. Glowing portion of the nebula is about 100 light years in extent. 1499 is probably illuminated by oh, one of those Perseus stars. Let's see here. I 
thought it was this star right here. It's a ninth magnet double star. Nope. Uh, same that. See how we're doing. Yeah. If I had a good flat and a good dark, this might start to be a decent, decent little image. So, Bill, you have looked at the horse head, but not the Californian the hydrogen beta. So, what was your experience on that hydrogen beta, and like, what was the aperture that you that you were using? You know, have you guys looked through a night vision eyepiece on a on a decent size scope? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but those uh, those night vision eyepieces are, uh, as an astrophotographer saying this, maybe it's it's not exactly authentic, but they are expensive. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's see here. What's let's do a little DIY NASA playing around with some of this. Uh, okay, there we go. Maybe pull that down just a touch. It's it's not doesn't have a whole lot of delicate controls here <laughs> to manage this stretching but uh, and of course from an astrophotography point now we enhance every image we make it starless and then we stretch the nebulosity and then we add the stars back in yeah it's crazy um, just like Ansel Adams nothing is as it appears photographically it's all subject to manipulation <laughs> And nothing is true. So, uh, yes, uh, Chris K. Yes, I did that in Mansfield, Ohio, in their big. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah, that would be cool, Chris, to see that night vision eyepiece in, or in something like that. 11 inches, and it did bring out the horse head fairly well. Definitely better, and of course, in dark skies, even better. That's cool. That's cool, Bill. Yeah, I've never seen it visually, you know, without electronic assistance. So that would be that would be a cool experience. So this is the star, right? I know you can't see it, but the bright star up here by the uh, by the dust spot. That's the the star that's really illuminating that nebulosity, right? I'm glad I've got so many knowledgeable folks on here with me tonight. I don't need to pretend like I know it. Why did this window resize? Gosh, I'm sorry, guys. Um, every time I go away and come back, this window has changed in size. And I'm not sure why it's doing that. My apologies. Uh, okay. I hope it stays. Stay there. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's do... Um, I was going to go back to Sky Safari. Okay, I don't think I have this zoomed out enough to see that star, right? Yeah, there it is. This star right here, right? Yeah. This is, this is a 12th magnitude star in Perseus apparent magnitude... It's one of the hottest and most massive stars visible to the naked eye and is probably responsible for illuminating the nearby California Nebula, NGC 1499. Menkeb is a sparkling blue-white class 07.53 giant with a surface temperature of around 37,000 Kelvin. Okay, it's around 40 solar masses at birth. Generates a powerful solar wind, and that's at a rate of 10 million times that of the sun's solar wind, and has already lost 10% of its original mass. Isn't it amazing what we can know about a star? 
Minkib is also a runaway star. It is traveling at a high speed away from its birthplace in the Perseus OB2 Association, which also contains its sister star, Attic. Wow, that that's cool. I don't know that I knew that. So let's go back see how we're gathering data. Yeah, this star up here, upper left, near the dust spot, that's the one illuminating that solar wind illuminating this uh, nebulosity of California Nebula. So that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's California. Save that. Live astronomy. How many objects have we seen? Thank you. And thank you all for joining me so much. I really appreciate it. If you joined us late, I encourage you to go back and check the replay because we have uh, the comet earlier and uh, some other discussions. The Novak collaboration on SH2-224, we talk about that. Um, and I don't have a good planetary setup. I know Mars is nearby, but it would just be a big, bright object. Um, we've done Horsehead, we've done Orion, and, well, I know it's crazy, but let's, let's do something crazy here. Let's see if we can get a, let's see if we can get a moon image, uh, video of the moon. This is not a real ideal lunar observing setup. I normally, if I'm even going to use this scope, I'd put at least some Barlow, Barlow options on it. And so we're going to assume we're centered. So what we're going to do here is go from live to video. And... Let me change the, oh boy, oh boy. Okay. Exposure. I'm not sure how to change the exposure <laughs> with with uh, a laptop. Let me come over here and change the. There we go. At least be able to change the resolution. So we, that should give us the full moon or full lunar size. Okay. Now if I can just figure out. Oh, here we go. Now I got my, now I got it. We're going to have to change everything, aren't we? Get that gain down. Oh, and I need to make sure, okay, that's not doing anything. Do I have any lunar experts here tonight? Doesn't look like it's very well focused. <laughs> it was probably a little off on that. Okay. Yeah. Woo. Well, I'll blame it on the seeing, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's actually a relatively 
short focal length. So, uh, but the uh, the lunar rays here show up well in this exposure. And let me see if I can uh, get this centered up a little bit. Let's see here. Nope. There we go. Um, rate. Let me pull that rate down. Let's see what happens here. There we go. If you've not checked, I tell you, I've had a blast with my um, solar imaging. But yeah, this is... So what do I do? <laughs> just for fun? Maybe I'll grab some video. I just don't think I've got this thing focused well enough. But, you know, having said that, if you sit here and look at it, you can see the scene pop in and out, but I'm still not sure. This is only 400 millimeters, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab some video just for funsies. And, you know, the ASI has um, some pretty cool processing for planetary. I am not a planetary imager. Oh, thank you, Franco. Yeah, that is weird why it's doing that. I had no clue it was even doing it. Yeah, look at that. So now it made it smaller. Huh. Yeah. Thank you, Franco, for letting me know that. I have no idea it's doing that unless you tell me. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, Chris. I know we needed sunglasses. Tim, uh... One image every five minutes, going to try a line and use blink to see if I can see the craters on the terminal filling. Yeah, that would be cool, Tim, to show a shadow, shadow moving across the uh, crater. So I'm just going to grab some video. Make sure I've got some of the settings here. And video, MP4 plus AVI. This is probably saved from my solar. Um, no music. Okay, that's good. We're at 1080p. Yeah, and then I might just run it through that ASIR software and see if it can grab any frames that look halfway decent. I'm getting 30 frames per second. Not, not amazing because I'm um, probably at that short exposure. Probably what I could do is increase gain and see it actually starts to drop as it starts to get, grab it. I'm assuming it's saving it to the, to the um, USB drive that I have on here. Let's do one thing, just to play around. Thanks for bearing with me here. Six milliseconds was pretty good. Let's increase gain. And then decrease, see if we can take that exposure. Yeah. Maybe that'll help give us a little higher frame rate. Yeah, this, this is less, sig seriously less than ideal. <laughs> and I don't know, the moon, yeah. We're, we're, we're going to try it. Okay, let's grab some there. Yeah, yeah, I'm over 30. And then, you know, as the buffer starts to fill up, this is... Um, this is a big problem in running the video through the ASI Air because that's probably where the bottleneck is on the video stream, get, grabbing video. So when I do the solar imaging with the hydrogen alpha, I like to um, do, I have a long USB uh, 3 cable 
and I'll just do a direct USB 3 straight into the laptop because that's probably the biggest weakness of the um, Raspberry Pi or the ASI Air is that it really can't handle the graphics processing of video grabbing. So I try to just come directly off of the camera into the laptop and that's why I have that cable that I didn't know why I had it. It's like a 60 foot long USB 3 cable I just found uh, in my setup. So let's do something real quick. A couple of questions I'd like to answer on the moon. Um, let's go there. Yeah, I'd probably have to flip that image, right? Yeah. But yeah, these, um, well, they don't really show it, do they? Well, we've got... Uh, Mare Chrysium, Mare Serenitatis, Tranquilitatis, Tranquilitatis, Tranquility. And then I was wondering about those uh, rays, those areas of rays. There we go, on that side, okay. So what are those? That would be over here. That's probably off of these two craters, I'm guessing. Those rays coming off, St Stoffler. Let me go back. Yeah, I love those. Uh, these rays right here, yeah, yeah. I probably didn't nail uh, focus, but pretty nice view. All right, let's see, where are we here? Okay, I think now might be a good time. Let's close out with some of the objects over in Monoceros. And, oops. And by the way, I could not get my ASI Air mount, I'm sorry, the, I should say the uh, AM5 mount to talk to Sky Safari Pro on the MacBook. Um, and I don't think I'm alone on that. So I think other people are having issues there too. Hmm. What is the Rosette Nebula? Um, designation. There's cone. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Mm. There we go. Sorry. Okay, let's do Rosette. I think we can get there. Let me see where we are on the Meridian. Yeah, I think we can get there. Let's, uh, it's going to be close. It's going to be close. It's going to be close. Let's give it a try. Let's do uh, Rosette, and then we'll do um, Cone Nebula, and then that'll be the evening. Thank you for joining me. Okay. Let's start grabbing our 10-second exposures and see if we can see the Rosette.
Okay. And you start to see some of it popping in here. We're not in the trees. So let's give this <clears throat> a few minutes of data integration. I can start to see the outer shells of the uh, rosette coming in. Let's play around a little bit with the stretch here. There we go. Can you see it? See the, the cluster on the inside of the rosette here? Okay, here's what I'd like to do. Some of you may have joined us late. And if you did, what I'd like to do is show you the scope setup that I used tonight. And then we will come back and check our rosette nebula as it is gathering data. And we'll see how it looks here in a second. Hey, thanks for joining me. This is Jeff, Jeff Ball Photography, for our live stream of some winter deep sky objects tonight. We may stop by the moon for a quick view. And I'm running out of time, so I wanted to show you what the telescope gear is that we're using tonight. So we've used this gear before. This is uh, the Astrophysics 92 millimeter, basically just a little more than three inch refractor. And it has the a focal reducer on the back as well as the ZWO ASI 294 MC color camera. Now it's getting dark. We are going to auto guide while we do some deep sky stacking tonight with the Botter uh, small refractor and the 120 mm camera. All of this is on the ZWO AM5 mount with the carbon fiber tripod. I carry this all out in one piece and we are just a little bit south of Huntington, West Virginia. This is due north. This is where the city is. That's where my sky glow is and the south is not bad. I have a pretty decent southern sky. I'm right on the Bortle 4 edge and uh, so Let's, uh, let's see how we're doing tonight with this setup. We're hoping to do some live stacking as well as uh, of deep sky objects and then maybe check out uh, Comet, the Green Comet. So here's our cone, our, our rosette still building data. And let's play around a little bit more with that stretch. Yeah, you can start to see the outer shells of it. And uh, yeah, DIY NASA, I know. The cone, yeah, I think um, for our purposes would just largely be uh, just trying to see the uh, cluster shape. And there could be some of that brightness. It probably look a lot like the, uh, what was it, IC43, the Cassiopeia. Um, nebulosity, we might just capture a hint of it. So let's see what happens, though, in, in RGB. I've done very little RGB here lately <laughs> myself. Um, but there's the rosette looking good. Let's go to um, Sky Safari and see if we can find some nuggets on, on the rosette. Another fantastic Rob Gindler. I remember when he posted this image. Oh gosh, 20 years ago now. <laughs> and what was amazing, he did, he did all of his imaging from his driveway. And um, this was uh, way before, this was back when Santa Barbara Instruments Group's SBIG was the leading manufacturer of imaging gear, of uh, CCDs, so yeah long time ago. NGC 2244 is that open cluster right there. Right there in the middle, discovered by John Flamsteed, 1690. And William Herschel is also in on that. Um, today, the following are used to describe various parts of the nebula. So you have, you know, brighter parts of this nebula and uh, probably, I guess, these hydrogen walls part of the nebulosity region. Uh, some of it's discovered by John Herschel. You can see this visually. Um, it's a vast cloud of dust and gas extended over one, de one degree across and covers an area about five times that of the full moon. So it looks great in binoculars, that cluster does. 
The nebula itself is more difficult to spot visually and requires telescope with low magnification at a dark site. Good sky transparency and a wide field eyepiece will show faint circular glow around 60 by 80 by 60 in diameter with central hole containing NGC 2244. That's what you can see is that contrast around the hole there. Rosette Nebula is easier to observe photographically. It's the only way to record its red color, which is not seen visually. I'm glad they state that. It's about 5,200 light years. And when you see deep exposed photographs, you can see that it's part of that molecular cloud and monoceros through the, you know, that's connecting up here with the cone nebula as well. Let's see how our data is accumulating. And let's do a little contrast on that. Thank you for joining. If you're joining late, I'd ask you to go back and check out our full broadcast. We've done a lot. There we go. A little bit better contrast. There's our Rosette Nebula. <coughs> Excuse me. Start to see those structures. So these dark lanes within that outer nebulosity shell. You can see definitely a nice dark structure here. These are probably, I don't know if Barnard, I'm pretty sure Barnard cataloged some of these dark structures. Um, just out of curiosity, just, just to show you one thing. I found this book, used book. I know we don't buy, we don't buy books anymore. But um, this is a book, A Photographic Atlas of Selected Regions of the Milky Way by Barnard. And I love this book. This is one of my favorites. So uh, it would take me probably a little too long here to find the rosette. Um, should have looked that up beforehand, but I'm pretty sure Barnard has cataloged that uh, some of those have Barnard classifications. At one time, and there is a, an Astronomical League Barnard certificate. It's quite extensive, and you can do it photographically. I think there's a visual and a photographic option. And uh, But I encourage you to check it out. Daggone it, did that thing resize again, or am I zoomed in? Let me see here. I'm zoomed in. So let me go back. Let me make sure we're still getting you the full broadcast. There we go. All right, at least that screen hasn't. So we are, that is 44 images stacked and almost 10 minutes. So that's pretty cool. You can see the rosette, right? It's no uh, unistellar EV scope, right? But uh, it's not bad. That's fine. All from the comfort of my office. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to save that. If you're just joining us, I'll probably put these images up on a special blog post to my web page. I'll have the link in the descriptions. And just to show all the things that we observed tonight. Unfortunately, I did not save that comet image. Hey, John. Uh, John Pankos. Hey, everyone. Just now saw Jeff's email. Hey, sorry. <laughs> well, we've had a good night, but you can always watch the replay, and, and the chat should be live as well. Uh, but thanks for joining us. We got the comet earlier in the evening. We've done a lot of observing here, a lot of conversation. I think most of it has been truthful and accurate. Uh, but I wouldn't swear to it, at least from my part. But, but the chat, they know what they're talking about. Those are my experts. Uh, but thanks for joining us. And I think we're going to go try just one more object here before we shut down for the night. And that's going to be that cone area. I wanted just to see, out of curiosity, what we pick up here in the cone area area I think largely we let's see what we get let's see what we get if you're just joining us we are doing 10 second of exposures on live accumulation typically Accumul accumulating those 10 second exposures for about 10 minutes and um, now we are going over and I do have a dark spot here that 
a flat would correct, but I did not get a flat. I did not have time to get a flat in tonight. So that's a dust moat that's there. And I think we will get some of that. We definitely are going to get that reflection nebulosity. And we may get some of the uh, red nebulosity here too. Let's let this gather here for a minute. While we do that, let's go to Sky Safari and see if we can pick up a few tidbits on the rose uh, on the cone nebula area you can see this well here's a good depiction as a matter of fact one thing i like to do i love this in sky safari you can do the hydrogen alpha screen and this is uh i love this presentation of the sky if you are a narrow band imager or a hydrogen alpha imager this i think makes uh, Sky Safari 6 Pro worth its weight in gold. So you can see this entire monoceros structure here that goes from the rosette NGC 2244 up through the cone. So that is a great presentation. But this is where we are, and you can see it's a kind of a complex object in that, you know, some call it the Christmas tree cluster. Um, it's kind of, this is the top of the Christmas tree. Oh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I don't think you can on this software. But if you see the cone right here, um, I'm going to put it right on the edge of the frame. That star right there is the top of the tree, and that's the bottom of the tree, okay? Top of the tree, that star, and then bottom of the tree. So the tree is actually pointed down toward the left of the frame. So we're getting this blue right here. I'm putting it on the edge of the frame. That's the blue we're picking up in our image. So let's see what the object info is. Cone Nebula and Christmas Tree Cluster, NGC 2264. Constellation Monoceros, it's a large, bright cluster, easily visible in finder scopes and binoculars. It's about 80 stars from 8th magnitude and spans a half a degree, embedded in extensive but tenuous nebulosity, which may be glimpsed with larger telescopes under clear, dark skies. There's those clear, dark skies again. The cluster spans some 20 light years and lies about 2,600 light years away. The nebula belongs to a much larger complex, which is currently an active star forming region. And again, that's where I love this Milky Way presentation that just shows you the, the uh, connectivity of these hydrogen regions and. Uh, you know, you know what some of this is in Orion on uh, Barnard's Loop. Just amazing, uh, that presentation. So I love that. And we're starting to see a lot of photographic images now that are actually revealing the entire ex extension of this hydrogen alpha cloud. So it's pretty amazing. You need good dark skies. I actually have a wide field hydrogen alpha filter that I'm hoping to use this year on some wide field stuff so I'm really looking forward to that and uh, let's see how we're doing on our on our data accumulation it looks like we're just going to get that probably just that reflection nebulosity here yeah start to see it uh, we can maybe throw a little stretch at it but I don't think we're gonna get much of that red the red really responds to uh, narrow band filtering And, uh, but it was worth, worth a try. This is, uh, uh, yeah, that's just the reflection part of the nebulosity. Let me go back to uh, Sky Safari and show you that. Yeah, I guess it's uh, 15 monoceros. We're getting we're getting this stuff right here. Yeah, right in through here.
Yeah, I know, right? I know, Chris, and um, DIY. Yeah, that that presentation of uh, they you can get multiple uh, ways to present this. Let me see if there's another good. I mean, you can get it down into different megahertz, fourteen twenty megahertz, Rosat, X-ray, Fermi gamma ray image, uh, but this hydrogen alpha. For us, for the amateurs and looking to do imaging, wow, what a great uh, visual resource here. And just look at this. Look at this explosion. Southern Hemisphere has all the cool stuff. Look at that. Goodness. Okay. Let's uh, step back to the FaceTime. I don't think we're probably picking up any a whole lot of the red. Yeah, it's just there's a little. Well, here we go. Can you see it? I don't know if I've got the. Uh, I know somebody asked about the Hubble variable nebula. I can't. I don't know if it's in my field of view here. I know it's close, but there's the cone right there. We are starting to get it. See it? That's the. That's part of the cone right there. It's it's upside down. See, that's the tip of it right there. And uh, hopefully you can start to see that structure come out. Yeah, we're starting to see a little bit. That's cool. And we are about eight minutes in to imaging. Yeah, that's, that's better than I thought it would be. Yeah, I'm starting to see some of that structure come out. Eight minutes of 10 seconds of exposure. So that's where I'm going to stop, guys. I'm going to stop that there. I'm going to save that image. I'll probably put up a little web, a blog page that just has um, some of these images. If you want to revisit or share with somebody and say, hey, this, this guy was doing this live and yakking about some things. But um, what I'd like to do is uh, end with... Oh, if I... It, 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 thanks for joining me. <laughs> thanks for helping. Thanks for your input. Thanks for correcting some things I may have said incorrectly. And um, I hope to see, I know most of you, so I hope to see you all under a dark sky here soon. The winter has just been rough for many, many reasons. Uh, and we, when we've had, we've never really had a clear night uh, that I can think of. We've had some nice windows and the windows just never synced up with my schedule. But this is the first time um, first time I've had a chance to really uh, get out under the, the stars. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to getting to a dark sky. Check out the channel. Check out the videos. Drop me a line if you have any questions. I'm going to play my Year in the Cosmos video right here uh, at the end. And I will sign off. But uh, And I'm going to say thanks to all. Um, oh, hey, Michael. Thank you for joining, Michael, for the first time. Thank you, Franco. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, DIY. Um, yeah, that 1420 megahertz is in there. Wow, I have to get this. I have an app for the phone. Yeah, I know the, the app. I use the app. I like the app. But boy, I, um, I don't, I'm assuming that <clears throat> Sky Safari is available on all platforms. And I'm assuming that all of the features are the same across platforms. But this is on the MacBook, and that feature is amazing. I agree. I'm glad. I'm glad I remembered <laughs> to share with you, and uh, I'm glad it looks like it was a, was a big impact. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks to all who joined. Thank you, John. I'm going to end with uh, my Year in the Cosmos video that I produced uh, to celebrate the images that I gathered through 2022, and I'm really looking forward to uh, 2023. And if I see you out under a dark sky, say hi. Until uh, then, thanks, guys. Clear skies, and we'll see you next uh, live broadcast. Take care.